Uh, my name is Perry, and I'll be talking to you today about serverless. Um, I just want to give a tiny bit of background. Um, uh, and Roderick is standing in the white shirt in the back. He and I have been working together for a very long time. And about um, two years ago, we started working on serverless technology, and we created uh, OpenWhisk, which is the leading open source serverless technology. We partnered with WSA2 and have been working with Amila and his team to bring you together, bring together the WSA2 serverless solution. So today I'm going to start by talking about what serverless is, uh, give you some examples of it. Um, we'll sh actually show you a little video of it in action. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, how you might, <laughs> there's a new line missing, how one might go about adopting it. And then Amila will talk about use cases and then wrap up with WSO2 serverless solution. And there's the link if you want to check it out later. And of course, feel free to talk to either Emil or myself or Roderick. And Roderick will be talking about serverless and Ballerina tomorrow at BallerinaCon. So first, serverless. How do we get here? What is serverless? Why is it even called serverless anyway? Sounds confusing. Obviously, they're servers. And why do you want it? So here's a very possibly bias and very rough history of compute resources and how we allocate it. At the very beginning, we started with bare metal. Of course, we had to start with actual machines. And that went on for a very long time. And although we had virtual machines, they did not become well known until about 15 years ago. But of course, everyone by now thinks virtual machine has been around forever. And that's the new baseline, unless you have very special needs. And about five years ago, containers became very hot. Although Again, containers have been very hot, have been around for at least 10 years. And similarly, now we're at uh, serverless or function as a service. Now, serverless um, has also been around for a, a few years, but has only become super hot as of like a, a year or so ago. And so that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And I will just kind of highlight some of the differences between those four ways of looking at uh, compute resources along three dimensions, physical, temporal, and semantics. So with bare metal, obviously, you get the entire machine. That's why it's called bare metal. With virtual machines, you typically get either the whole machine or a fairly large fraction of a machine. So you might get 16 cores, chop it up into four pieces, and you have your four virtual machines. Containers are a very nice way of deploying software such that they typically would occupy a small number of cores on your bare metal machine. And then finally, we go to the extremes where serverless, you would be using a fraction of a core, so maybe a quarter, an eighth, whatever it takes to get the job done most efficiently. The temporal aspect is probably even more extreme. So of course, with bare metal, if you want to actually acquire, you might have to go through a procurement process. It could take days to weeks. With virtual machines, you're hopefully down to hours if you're in a good organization, but actually it could take days depending on you know, your uh, approval process. And with containers, we're now finally down to minutes. That's why developers are so, so excited about containers, because they would just be able to, to run stuff. Serverless takes a, a step further, and not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. Those things are sort of static things. So serverless is not just faster. It is completely dynamic. The thing is schedule. So the previous speaker used the phrase distributed supercomputer, and that's in a very apt term, because serverless is sort of treating your entire distributed resource as a single large computer that we would schedule very rapidly and efficiently these functions onto. And then finally, the semantics, or the contract that is being made with a user of these technologies. With bare metal, uh, you're, you're seeing it as hardware. So you literally would, might have to go around switching uh, you know, graphics cards or, or whatever. Uh, virtual machines, you might be. Um, you're, you're exposed to it as hardware when you're on the IT side of things and software when you're on the user side of things. Then with containers, you're viewing your, your uh, system as a, a little OS that somehow is dedicated to just you. And then with serverless, finally, we are living in the developer, even at deployment time, is living in a world of a language runtime, so code only. And as you go from left to right, you increase your agility. You, fully empower the developers so that they are all the way at the deployment phase and can take control of the service from the initial development process all the way to the deployment. So what is serverless? Serverless is function as a service. It's just how the terminology came about. Uh, serverless, I'll start with the second point. Serverless is, is, it's called serverless because we don't need to talk about servers. It's not that there are no servers. Of course, there are servers in the back running. but 
you as a user don't have to talk about servers, or for that matter, containers. Function as a service is about making it logic first. So you take your code and you can deploy it, just the business logic portion of it. You don't have to talk about code like Apache Web Server or some you know, app framework or talking about servers or VMs, but you de deploy it directly. And that's what the video I'm going to show you later is going to uh, illustrate in, in actual, you know, in a way you can actually see. But for now, let me just continue with sort of high-level words. Um, why, do I, why do I like serverless so much? I've used all of these technologies before. It's because when I put on my hat as a user and not as you know, IT researcher or something like that, I can focus on the thing that actually matters to me, the logic. And the only thing you have to learn is ser as the serverless CLI, which I will show you in a bit. And it's not that I'm hiding a lot in just that one phrase. It actually is very, very little, as you'll see. The alternative is using something like containers and Kubernetes. Now, that, those are very fine technologies from an infrastructural point of view and orchestration. They are great. But from someone who wants to get maximum productivity out of a developer focusing on business logic, it's not perfect because you have to learn about servers. But I, I don't mean the physical server, but like a server application like Express in JavaScript or Apache server. You have to learn about containers and the concepts of containers and Docker files, image repository orchestration. You're in charge of uh, scaling and monitoring and those things. And so, well, I can't go back, so I'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, serverless is also a fully elastic deployment. So uh, it's very efficient in terms of its resource utilization. So the code is executed on demand. So if no one is using it, there is no, no, no resource, no CPU running the code at all. It is loaded dynamically and executed at runtime. And it can do so fast enough measure in milliseconds that it's actually feasible. Of course, you could always like, sort of do that, but if you took minutes to do it, it would be totally unusable. But we can do it fast enough that it's in, in, in essentially in real time, that you can actually write interactive applications like chatbots using serverless. Uh, this is a managed system, and so scaling and recovery are built in. There's, as I said, no uh, prior provisioning. So if your logic or traffic to a particular um, REST or uh, microservice is uh, low or inactive, you are not wasting resources or dollars on it. And then because we've raised the abstraction level above the operating system to the level of the runtime, that means you are not in charge of that part. That means if there's an OS upgrade that's needed or it turns out JavaScript version whatever has a vulnerability, we can patch that and the logic can take advantage of that. What is that better utilization of from this dynamic scheduling means? It means that you're spending less. Um, it's a common, uh, it's common to, <clears throat> it's well understood that VMs are, t are underutilized. I didn't actually know the number and I've been actually asking different uh, people at the conference and I was surprised that everyone came up with approximately the same number. So it probably seems is right. Um, many VMs are utilized only at 20% or lower levels. And that's because they're not able to dynamically schedule across uh, all the resources. And serverless basically puts all your logic into a, a big pool so that everyone can sh use the resources and there's not you know, over-provisioning at every level. And this is really important, particularly when you are using a microservice architecture because the more pieces there are, the more each piece can waste, waste things. And so in aggregate, the waste, wastage can be large. Serverless solves that. And just to sort of uh, repeat, it's sort of a corollary, but um, it's important to point out that even using containers does not solve that problem because if you have a container running something, it's sitting there using up the resource. Whereas in serverless, it's not using any resources at all. So takeaway. I said all this earlier, but here the, here's the takeaway. Serverless is about abstraction. It's about raising the level of contract to put the developer, developer to the level of functions, no OS, no container, none of that. It's about fast auto scaling up to meet the needs of, the, of the, uh, the workload, but also down to zero so you're not wasting resources. It's about a managed infrastructure so that the uh, organization managing it, such as WSO2, is responsible for creating new, updating to new language versions, OS patches, providing you with logging and tooling, which Amelia will show you later. And finally, you can actually jump, if you're in a monolithic war and want to try out 
microservices. You can actually develop microservices, which is a ar software architecture, on top of the concrete serverless technology without necessarily learning with or dealing with containers. So now I'm going to show you a video, uh, not yet. Um, what you'll see, I'm, go I'm going to try to pause the video because it goes by kind of quick. It's about 40, 45 seconds. And it's, I'm going to show you code, deploy, and run in 46 seconds. Well, it's going to take longer than that because I'm going to keep saying pause. But the starting point here is just a hello world. Play. This is me typing. Pause. Uh, so I, I ran whisk action list. Whisk is the command line tool, WSK. So WSK action list says, what functions have I deployed in my account? And I have hello world deploy, which you can see there's the code above, above it. Play. I'm going to change it to hello San Francisco. Then I'm going to deploy, I'm going to deploy it. So I'm going to go whisk action create named of action, hello SF, and then give it the source file. Pause. That's it. It's deployed. I want to emphasize that I just typed that. It is in the cloud right now. It is actually uh, not no longer on my, it, well, it's also the code is there on my machine, but it's actually also in the cloud in, in my deployment of OpenWhisk at the moment. Play. And you can see that it's there, because if I do a list command again, there it is. And if I, I can now run it. And I'm just passing extra flags to make the output readable. So that was, you can see it's 40, 43 seconds. So uh, can, can you play again and go? Yep, thank you. So that's the result of running that action. It's showing you that we're using JSON as the, uh, as the mechanism for, uh, if you can go back to the very end. Y you can see that the, it, it's okay. It just, uh, you, you can see that the result is there, um, showing you the result of running that program. And when that happened, that was also executed in the cloud. So none of the, these two commands are not happening locally on my machine. Uh, next slide. So just to show you exactly what happened, when I ran that command, I sent code through the endpoint, which is called a controller, to a code store. And that's it. The function is now deployed even though there is no container running it at the moment. So, and that's, you know, in words, that's, exact, that's what I did. That's all that command does. And then next, I ran it. It says, run the function. It showed me the result. As soon as I run that, it goes to the controller, which asks the executor to please run my program. It will go and get the program and run it. And it does all that in, in uh, I think, around, what is it, Roderick? 11, 11 milliseconds. Not, of course, this does not include the tr network traffic to get to the, you know, depends on where you are. And, and that's the reason that serverless is different. It's because of the scale. So all those things where I say dynamic and all that, it's fast enough that you can actually do this in real time. I'm going to give you a little bit more of a, a, sort of a more realistic example of how you might use serverless now. So let's say you wanted to do a little website. This, this is, this is, I believe, live right now. So actually, if you go to that URL, you should be able to load this page. <clears throat> so if I have a website that has static and dynamic content, how might, I, how, might, how, might, how might I do that? Well, I can do that if I, if I have a static page, I just write some HTML. And I display it, and I have some static images, and I also put those in HTML and load it. But what about the dynamic content, like the prices, which would be stored in some database? How would I surface that? Well, you can actually surface that by using serverless, because you can use the serverless to, uh, to uh, materialize the um, get the price microservice. And so here's how the architecture for something like that might look like. You have a static storage where you store your static content. You have your database or data store storing your data that's more like data and not static content. And then serverless bridges the gap. It provides a way of 
um, retrieving the data and performing whatever formatting might be needed or, or piece of logic. That can then get, be combined with your static storage. And if you put that together, you can actually create a, a web page. And in fact, I think Roderick's built a couple of mini websites and you know, other people have built even, even larger websites using technology like this. It's not specific to a website. This is just an example of showing how you can surface logic in a very lightweight manner. And I now change that box to serverless instead of executor, controller, code storage, right? It says serverless in the bottom because the point is you don't need to know what's happening inside. You just get to use it and you get to run your code and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, what is really happening in that web page? Well, the web page actually makes a call to the serverless. You can see the box in the top. That's a REST API that I'm using there. And I happen to call the um, package fruit stand, and then I happen to call my action price, and fruit is the parameter. And then what's happening in the serverless function is that line there, data store that key, that is the line that talks to the database. And I haven't shown you all the code because I didn't want to show you, know, show you a bunch of HTML, but that's approximately it besides the, you know, all, the, all the images. So what does it take to actually adopt serverless? Well, it essentially comes down to not too many things. Uh, a microservice-like architecture and statelessness. So the first one is not, nothing new here. Like the previous speaker, I do not want to spend a long time talking about microservices. But I will say that any, something that already is in a microservice-like architecture is a good candidate for serverless because what you need to do is have functions that's, that's pretty small. The parts should be fairly lean, but don't go too crazy and chop everything as small as you can. Pick small logical units. Um, Functions should be relatively ephemeral, so they should take on the order of milliseconds to perhaps a few minutes. If you want something that runs a very long time, it is possible with serverless, but that's not necessarily where the sweet spot is at the moment. Uh, the, like a microservice, it should have a narrow and pretty well-defined API. And finally, uh, functions can be integrated together, um, either by calling out in itself or by composing uh, functions. And by building up these units, you can actually form some of the cells that you saw earlier. This part is probably more, um, more new to people who might not know what it takes to be serverless. And that is, uh, it needs to be, quote, stateless. Now, I, I put air quotes because it doesn't really mean it's stateless. I, I don't know why we ended up with these slightly confusing terminology, but that's what it is. Stateless means that the function in itself has no state. It doesn't mean that it can't access state. It just means that when it comes up, it's, it has no prior state. But mo many applications are already like this because in a good, well-designed uh, system, the state is typically stored in a blob storage or a data store for resiliency reasons. And so stateless just emphasizes that more because functions really require this. It means that for the function that requires state to run, it has to go fetch the state and possibly update the state if necessary. So in the case of the, the database, the price table earlier, we pulled it in. Now, this might sound a little scary. It sounds like we might like like keep bringing up containers or whatever every single time because how, why otherwise, why otherwise would you not have state? And uh, in fact, we do not keep bringing up the system over and over again. It's just that as a matter of semantics, you can't rely on the state being there. And so you have to write it as if you should be prepared for the state not to be present. And now, um, Emil is gonna talk about use cases and the serverless solution. Thank you, Barry. Is it working? Okay. So, uh, no, you, I think you are now up to date with uh, serverless and you know uh, the importance of it. So, I'll quickly take you through some uh, use cases and then uh, introduce you to the serverless solution. So, uh, one of the very common candidates for serverless is uh, the event-driven executions. For example, like uh, if you have some logic which you want to execute based on some event, for example, uh, you know. When uh, we uh, insert something to your database, you want to execute uh, some code, or else uh, you place some file in a blob storage, then you want to process that, and uh, you get some messages through uh, pub subsystems. So uh, uh, you want to uh, process that message. So those kind of event-driven uh, scenarios are very good candidates for serverless. And uh, your logic can you know, filter that messages and then also process 
uh, process it, for example, like let's say uh, there's a, for an ex example, uh, if a supermarket chain wants to update their prices like, you know, every night, so what they need to do is like you, they, they place the price list as a file in some storage and then uh, uh, an event will get triggered and then there will be a function which processes that file and either that function can directly update all the, the, all the retail stores or if not like it can place another message into a message broker where there will be another event which will execute another function and that function can update uh, the, the, the retail stores, so something like that. And then uh, we, we have, nowadays we have a lot of uh, uh, the SaaS apps and the social, social apps where they made a lot of events. So for, we know, all know uh, we, we, most of our code is now in GitHub and we use Salesforce, Twitter and all those things. Basically all those uh, SaaS apps, they have webhooks. So we can make use of these webhooks because uh, when something happens, they will invoke that endpoint. And so the thing is like this, this can be done using uh, uh, microservices as well, but the thing is, you need to keep them running always. So, uh, if you if you can put that logic into a function, then you can uh, uh, execute that when only when the event is triggered. So, this is also an event-driven case. And then another thing is like uh, you might uh, not there there can be scenarios where you can't predict the load. You need auto you, you need auto scaling, but you you, you don't know. The, the, sp the spikes you will be getting. So there are two approach. One, one is like, yes, you can deploy them in microservices and set up auto scaling, but still you need to have some idea. And the other one is like you, pre uh, you, you prepare for that spike and uh, cater in advance. That is a waste. So uh, in this case, like if you write the logic as functions, and uh, since the, the functions in a, a function platform are always in a scaling mode, like they start from zero, which means like they're always auto scaling, uh, scaling up and down. So they can handle uh, any load without any problem. And uh, so in the previous talk, no one mentioned in this agile, uh, agile world, like developers, they like to code in different, la different languages. Like uh, if, you are, if you are working on a project, we shouldn't be like uh, using the same programming language as, as a religion and try to do everything using that. Because some, lang some languages are good to do some things. For example, we know that uh, Python is good at certain things like machine learning, and then uh, Node.js is good for certain something else, and then uh, you know we have Ballerina as well. Uh, that's the Ballerina logo, uh, which is good at the integration stuff. So you can mix and match these uh, uh, programming languages and implement different different components of your solution using them, and you can pipe them uh, using the function platforms. So that is uh, another advantage. And then obviously we have these. Uh, time-based jobs or scheduled jobs. That is like uh, things happening once a day, once an hour, once every 30 minutes, and uh, those kind of things, you can execute uh, the log logic as functions. Right, now, uh, so I'll talk about the WSO2 serverless solution now. Now, the, an obvious question you will ask is, there are so many public offerings out there on, on uh, serverless, and why, why a private one? Uh, and uh, from WSO2. So it's all about the freedom, right? Uh, we all know that like when you, when you uh, go in to use some of these public offerings, uh, the languages are limited, uh, then uh, you have to use the event catalogs, and after you start using them, there's no escape, you are locked in. So basically we wanted to avoid this cloud locking and uh, let people to use serverless technologies in a, uh, with much freedom. So, WSO2 serverless solution is a private function as a service environment, which is based on Apache OpenWhisk and Kubernetes, and will be managed by WSO2 for you. That will be your uh, private environment, and you will not see it, you will not feel it, nothing. It will be completely taken care of by WSO2 with the experts uh, like Perry and Roderick uh, from Apache OpenWhisk. And all you have to do is add your developers to the system. And the developers will have to download the CLI, which you saw in that video, and they can just you know, start uh, writing their code and uh, deploying them to the function platform, and uh, they will just run. So there are some uh, advantages or the benefits from this. First one, I mentioned this is all about the freedom and the customizability. So there are a lot of customizable options. For example, one is like you can add 
almost any programming language which you wish. Now, when you go to public offerings, you know they support only three or four uh, languages, and also in those languages, they only support certain versions. So, about uh, two months ago, I got an uh, email from Amazon saying like they are retiring a certain uh, Node.js version in uh, Lambda. So, which means I have to migrate my code to the next version. But in this case, since this is private to you, you can keep any language and any version running as long as you like. And this can be plugged with third party tools because this is private to you. And uh, a, a bigger, uh, another advantage is you can define your custom resource limits. We know that when you go to public offerings, like there are templates like this much of memory comes with this much of CPU. So if, uh, if you want more CPU, then you will go to the next tier and or the next template uh, and it will have memory more than you need, but you will have to pay for that because like they charge for these computing resources. So, but uh, here you can define the resource limits you want for each and every of your functions. So if it's a compute heavy function, you can define, you can uh, allocate more CPU and if, it's, uh, uh, if it needs more memory, you can define more memory. And another advantage is like this allows you to plug your own event sources. So I mentioned one, one reason for the heavy cloud lock-in in public offerings is you have to use their event catalogs. As soon as you start using them, event catalogs and event emitting services, we call them, for example, you know, S3 and SNS and all those things. Uh, but here, uh, you can plug your own event sources. It can be a message broker, it can be your email, ser email server, it can be uh, a file, uh, FTP uh, location, it can be anything, uh, maybe uh, even your uh, repo, uh, GitHub repo. So that freedom is there. And then uh, another problem we have seen in the, the, the public offerings is like uh, people have to define their own ways of deploying, uh, custom, so, um, uh, custom ways of deploying this code to the uh, platform. So uh, we are allowing you to plug your function repository so when a developer pushes the function to the repository, it will get automatically deployed into the function platform. So kind of a continuous deployment uh, capability. And this can auto scale from zero to cater any of your load. And this is integrated with WSO2 API manager and identity server, which means uh, the functions you deploy can be uh, easily converted to uh, managed APIs and also uh, the identity server is there to control the access to the system. For, so we, we have this uh, namespace concept. So you can define namespaces for teams and uh, also you can define namespaces for different uh, life cycle stages like dev, test, prod. So uh, we can define uh, roles for them and which, which, which developers get to push, uh, push to which namespace. Uh, uh, so then using that we can, uh, for example, like we shouldn't let anyone to push anything to the production namespace because that's production stuff running there. So like that, you can control that. And we have integrated login and monitoring. So another problem that we have seen in public offerings is the logs and uh, the metrics are there, but it's not easy for you to uh, see them. You have to use the other services and create dashboards uh, and uh, things like that to easily uh, get access to them. So we have some tooling around this. So one is the CLI, uh, which uh, you saw in the video. And this is an, another extension to this. This is the, the shell, which is an electron app, where developers can uh, uh, you know, use this to uh, write functions and deploy them. So this uh, the one you see in the uh, left-hand side is uh, uh, a response to a uh, function they have invoked. And the other one uh, in the right-hand right, right -hand side is uh, some statistics on the latency. So it is good for them to know that, okay, my function took this much of time to execute. So they can like, uh, uh, improve their function code. And then uh, we have the monitoring and observability. So uh, here you see two graphs. So one is a resource utilization of the pods of Kubernetes because this runs on Kubernetes. And the other one is the statistics uh, of the uh, related to the functions, the number of invocations, latency, uh, how many errors were there. So the first one is not relevant to you at the moment because this will be completely managed by us. But the second one is important to you, so you can filter uh, based on your functions, the language, and all those things. So basically, this is important to uh, the team who has deployed functions to uh, this platform. 
Not only that, so we have the WSO2 serverless experts behind this, which means like we can come and help you to uh, decide, okay, how to uh, adopt this into your business and uh, design and implement some POCs. Also, uh, design on uh, decide on the migration strategies from your legacy uh, code to uh, cloud native uh, functions, uh, and uh, help with uh, testing and uh, delivery into the serverless world. So uh, we can provide that kind of a support to you. Right. So. Uh, as uh, we announced yesterday, this is available now under limited early access basis. Uh, so the pricing is flat. flat. Uh, you can pay per year or you can pay on a monthly basis as well, which means like uh, if you are interested, you can talk to us and uh, we can set up a deployment for you and then you can start using it. And if, if, if you want, you can pay on a monthly basis. And uh, so that's a lot of freedom to you. Uh, so. And uh, yeah, you can go to this page. Uh, this is the serverless page in WSO2.com site. And you can also contact us using our contact us form. Uh, also, uh, myself, Perry, and Roderick will be there in uh, the lobby or the oxygen bar. So you can come and talk to us. And uh, we may be able to show some certain, certain things using the laptop as well. Uh, we didn't want to do a demo because it takes time. And we wanted to educate you on the uh, serverless before we introduce a solution. So we had to share the time on that one as well. So with that, uh, we come to the end of the uh, presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, we can take a couple of questions. Right, so the question is like, uh, how is this is different from Lambda and how to use this, right? Uh, so the thing is like, yes, we'll be hosting this. We can host this in any infrastructure. Right now we are uh, going to host this in Google and AWS, uh, wherever the customer prefers. But the customer, they don't need to worry about where it is. We, they will only have an uh, endpoint which they uh, configure in the CLI of the developers. And they will write the functions, and they will push to their uh, push to a, a Git repository where we have configured that Git repository with this function platform, and the functions will get deployed. And then uh, we, uh, you will you, each function get an HTTP endpoint as well, and you can also make it an API as well. And uh, then we can uh, execute that. So the, the 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 thing is like as an organization, you don't need to worry about uh, the maintenance and, or, or where, it, where it is running. Um, how much I will, uh, you know, cost because the cost is like flat here. Uh, there are no hidden costs. No, th this is not. This is not related. This is not doing nothing with Lambda. This doesn't do anything with Lambda or Google Cloud Functions or Azure Functions. Nothing. This runs in OpenWhisk. These functions are executed in the OpenWhisk environment. They are, we have Kubernetes. On top of Kubernetes, we are deploying OpenWhisk, Apache OpenWhisk project. And we also have the API manager and identity server in, in the side. So these functions get deployed uh, in, the, uh, in OpenWhisk, which means like it has a, a, a code store where it uh, stores this code. And uh, all our executions go through OpenWhisk controller. There's a slide uh, which shows a controller. And the controller, then uh, there, there's something called the invoker. And it is uh, asking the invoker to execute this function. And then there will be a container coming up with that uh, code. And it will get executed. So this is a this is totally separate thing uh, than Lambda or Google Cloud Functions or anything. Basically, what we have is Apache OpenWhisk running inside this one. 